Our next speaker is Dr. Ilya Levin, who is the Director of Neurocritical Care Service at Mamani Medical Center uh, and a Assistant Professor of Neurology at Sunni Down State Health Science University. He completed his neurology residency at Penn State Medical Center in Hershey, Pennsylvania, before his met, um, Neurocritical Care Fellowship uh, at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, before he joined Mamani's as a attending in neurocritical care in 2016. He has board certification in neurology and neurocritical care. He's a, an award-winning teacher for the medical students, residents, and fellows with a special interest in intrusive hemorrhage and brain death. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Ida Levin, who's going to talk about state-of-art neurocritical care for stroke. Thank you, Ida. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, a little bit louder. Let's see, is this better? Excellent. I'm going to be talking about critical care management of acute ischemic stroke and some of the issues that we deal with and encounter in, uh, in the ICU. Um, I'm going to be touching on, you know, why specialized care? Does it make a difference in this patient population? Uh, I want to go over a bit about what type of patients we normally admit to the ICU and we encounter here, uh, what patients would meet criteria for ICU level of care with acute stroke. Um, we're going to walk a little bit through some of the critical care issues we deal with during their hospitalization, including blood pressure management, glucose control, temperature management, um, and we're going to touch on some of the complications and controversies that we deal with in neurocritical care, including cerebral edema, hemicraniectomy, and also uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, hemorrhagic complications after TPA or TNK administration. So why neurocritical care? It's really a broad question, not just neurocritical care. In general, does specialized care for this patient population make a difference, whether it's neurocritical care, whether it's uh, a dedicated stroke unit where there's expertise to manage patients with acute neurologic illness? Um, is there any data that it makes a difference uh, to patients long term? And the answer is yes. Over the last couple of decades, there's really been a body of, uh, of literature, uh, of evidence that, that, that shows that regardless of the metrics you look at, whether it's mortality, whether it's functional outcome, whether it's complications that are developed uh, in patient, uh, patients do better when, they're, when they get specialized care by uh, a multidisciplinary approach of experts who can deal with these neurologic issues. It really is important to kind of, not just to treat these patients, but to anticipate some of the problems that arise. And when you deal with, these, with this patient population, you really recognize patterns and uh, it's very important to not to react to issues that come up, but to anticipate them and be very proactive um, in managing them and, 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 you know, for everyone to be ready. You know, this body of literature, as far as outcomes in specialized centers, really led to this. Uh, you know, 2013, you have the Journal of Stroke that published primary and comprehensive cri certification criteria. There's one more at this point, thrombectomy-ready centers. Um, but comprehensive stroke is the highest level of certification you can have. And, you know, we at Maimonides here are a comprehensive stroke center and we see all sorts of, all spectrum of, of, of acute stroke, everything from a TIA to some of the most complex stroke patients that, 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 that come into us. As far as who usually is admitted to the ICU, you know, there's no hard and fast rule here, but we can go over some of the things that usually would bring patients to critical care. Uh, you can consider an ICU admission for patients that have received IV thrombolytic therapy, TPA, and or mechanical thrombectomy. I have to say our stroke unit is really good at, at, at managing and monitoring patients after TPA or TNK. Um, so otherwise uncomplicated patients, if they receive IV thrombolytic, they can be closely monitored in a stroke unit. Um, if, if they receive mechanical thrombectomy, we usually do admit them to an ICU. Um, and, you know, when they're ready, they can be downgraded to the stroke unit. 
fluctuating neurologic symptoms, right? You want to have patients that leave with the best possible exam we can. So if somebody is unstable and, you know, they have hemiparesis that waxes and wanes and gets better, you really need close monitoring for those patients and you want to prevent any secondary injury after the stroke. Uh, so these patients can often be admitted to ICU for observation and for very close monitoring. Patients with ICA or M1 occlusion, um, you know, we talked a little bit about of anticipation of problems. Some of these patients can be awake, alert, with an ICA occlusion, with M1 occlusion, and a couple of days later, they may be comatose with a blown pupil. So very often, if you have a, a proximal large vessel occlusion, ICA or M1, they can be good candidates for, for, for very close monitoring and anticipation uh, for possible deterioration, and they, they can be admitted to an ICU. Patients with an NIH stroke scale of 15 or more, and that's really considered as a severe stroke, and some of these patients may be eligible to be in the critical care setting. Uh, patients with multiple medical conditions, me multiple comorbidities, and they're at risk to decompensate. You have an acute stroke with a PE, right? These patients may need to be monitored in a critical care setting for very close observation. You know, in critical care, the fundamentals are going to be your ABCs, and, you know, stroke is no exception. Um, everybody with acute stroke, you really want to get a good sense, a good grasp of what's going on with their airway, breathing, and circulation. Patients with large stroke or with brainstem infarcts, they may have alterations of consciousness on arrival. A lot of patients have bulbar dysfunction, whether it's oropalatal weakness, tongue deviation, facial droops, and, you know, they're at risk for compromise of their airway uh, and, and aspiration. One of the things we don't want is hypercapnia. So carbon dioxide increases your intravascular vessels, leading to higher ICPs. So if you have hypercapnia in an acute stroke patient, that may be an indication to intubate the patient and get control of the airway. You don't want retention of, of CO2 in such a patient. Oxygenation is also a big issue. And again, we want to minimize secondary stroke injury. You know, patients come to us with an infarct, uh, and if they're desatting, that may worsen the neurologic injury that they already have. You know, here we have an image of a, of a classical right lower lobe pneumonia from, from aspiration. And the goal in these patients in the acute setting is to maintain O2 sat more than 94%. Um, pneumonia is very common, especially in ICU in these types of patients. They're either they're intubated or they're just given their severity of neurologic presentation. They often aspirate um, and, you know, in, from, from, from our experience and really per literature, up to half of these patients develop a pneumonia during their hospitalization. And that's why, you know, aspiration precautions are, are very much needed in this, in, in this subgroup. Intravascular volume. Um, you know, a patient that's coming in already has a lack of blood flow to a certain region of their brain. What you don't want to do is compound it with hypovolemia. You really want to ensure uvolemic status in, this, in, in these patients who are just arriving. It's interesting, you know, the rest of the critical care world really moved on to more balanced isotonic solutions. You know, most notably, you guys are probably familiar with plasma light, with lactated ringers. Um, this is probably, you know, the, the neurocritical care world or, you know, the acute TBIs, the trauma, it's probably the only subset where normal saline should still be used for majority of patients, and it is still recommended, and it's still in clinical practice, our go-to IV fluid acutely. Um, why, you know, the name is normal saline, it's, it's not really normal. It is mildly hypertonic. Um, so, you know, the concentration there is 154 of sodium, and you really don't want to give patients hypotonic fluids acutely at presentation you know, for the risk of maybe um, worsening their cerebral edema. Um, so often at presentation, a lot of patients may be hypovolemic. They often get a bolus, a, a bolus of fluids with, um, 
with acute ischemic stroke and, and they're given normal saline and a lot of our patients, especially if they're NPO on the initial acute part of the hospitalization, they get maintenance fluids with normal saline. Blood pressure, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about blood pressure and optimal targets. Um, it's again, a very specialized subgroup of patients where we have very, very specific blood pressure goals. Um, in otherwise a medical ICU patient, you may just say, you know, in, in, in some in, in septic shock, we want a, a map above 65. Here, it really makes a difference. And we often have more narrow blood pressure ranges, uh, depending on the specific case. We often use invasive um, arterial blood pressure monitoring for continuous BPs. Right in the acute part, in a very unstable or a sick patient with stroke, you may not get away with just non-invasive cuffs. So a lot of our patients end up needing arterial lines for continuous around the clock, very close blood pressure management. So what should the blood pressure be in some of these patients? This is straight from the guidelines. Uh, you know, if you did, if a patient did not receive reperfusion therapy, and reperfusion therapy here is very broad, meaning no IV thrombolytic, no mechanical thrombectomy. The guidelines recommend against very rapid blood pressure lowering in this, you know, in these patients. Um, and it is a, a little bit of the chicken or the egg. A lot of the acute stroke patients have a history of high blood pressure. It's one of the most important risk factors. But also the response of the brain to an acute stroke is to acutely elevate your blood pressure to increase perfusion to the brain. And you have to be careful about rapidly lowering blood pressure in, this, in these patients unless there's a good need to do that. Um, and it's interesting because there's not a whole... There's not a lot of patients in the hospital where we would be okay with blood pressure 220 over 110, right? A lot of people that rotate with us with different specialties, this is a number that really stands out to them. Um, so again, if you didn't get reperfusion therapy, no TPA, no TNK, no mechanical thrombectomy, it's okay for the first 24 to 48 hours to allow permissive hypertension. There are instances where you may want to be more aggressive in this group if there's signs of end organ damage, CHF from high blood pressure, renal damage from uh, acute hypertension. But a lot of these patients may tolerate and may want to be uh, on the higher side of this range. Um, usually we hold all antihypertensives acutely. Uh, I personally restart half of the beta blocker that they were on. You really don't want arrhythmias, beta blocker withdrawal. Um, so, you know, we give half of a beta blocker and all other antihypertensives are really held until you can get a good grasp of what's going on with the patient and when they can be slowly reintroduced. So for TPA or TNK, there are strict guidelines as far as what the blood pressure targets should be. You want to avoid hypertension here because, you, you, you know, you're giving folks an IV thrombolytic and potentially you can cause hemorrhagic conversion. Um, so we aim for less than 180 over 105, and that's that's consistent with all the guidelines. Um, and we we're, we're very careful, you know, after after administration of T TPA or TNK to, to to go below those numbers. It's very very important. Um, if you let folks write high and and they have a large stroke, you you have a higher chance of having hemorrhagic conversion, and we don't want that. How about blood pressure post thrombectomy. So this is a little controversial. There's no real cookie cutter answer here. There's not one target that we can aim for all patients. Um, I guess that's the takeaway here. It's very important to know the patient's baseline. Where do they spend most of their time? It's very important to know the technical success of the procedure. Are you getting all of the clot out? Is this a good Tiki score of three? Or is there still par partial thrombus that's left? Um, because if you still have a thrombus that's left and you acutely lower the blood pressure, you may cause more secondary injury to the brain. And it, the literature has been kind of chaotic here. You know, there are studies that show that patients after a successful thrombectomy with blood pressures less than 140 have a better functional outcome. A lot of these are retrospective studies looking back. Um, we need more data. You know, a lot of this really um, is not standardized. And may, we may just need to target 
each individual patient uh, in, in terms of customized medicine to what, what is appropriate in this specific scenario. Uh, I just want to share this trial with you guys. Uh, earlier this year, BEST-2 evaluated the safety of lowering blood pressure acutely after a successful thrombectomy. So all of these are high tiki scores. They're, they, they're complete or nearly complete reperfusion. They um, randomized 120 people to three different groups. The first group is less than 180, which is very similar to your TPA, TNK group. The second group is less than 160, and the third group is less than 140. And, it, you know, the trial is very interesting. You know, the end number is not as high given 120 patients, but it was really interesting data. The things that they looked at are uh, the, the, the volume of the infarct at 36 hours. So if you aggressively lower somebody's blood pressure, what is their volume of infarct uh, based on the MRI at 36 hours? And they also looked at a 90-day functional outcome, looking at the modified ranking score. And what did we find here? It's fairly interesting. So the patients, especially in the lower group, so the more aggressive you are with BP, even with successful thrombectomy, it, they didn't show any significant benefit, and there, was a, uh, and there was a trend towards worse outcomes and a higher infarct volume. Uh, and, you know, that trend was consistent. Um, you know, one one sixties and one forties did less than one than, than less than one eighty. So you know, more research needs to be done. We need to have um, better evidence. But it is, you know, some of the data is a little bit conflicting, and we really need to individualize at this point our, our blood pressure targets to the patient to the specific situation. Um, and and again, the takeaway from here is ninety day modified ranking was was really shifted towards worse, and the in, the infarct volume was larger at thirty six hours with more aggressive blood pressure control. Some of the first line antihypertensives uh, in in this situation in acute stroke, and this is really um, practiced around the country, are nicardipine, clavidipine. Both of these are calcium channel blockers that you can acutely. Uh, turn on and you can titrate as needed to the patient. Um, and that's the other thing, you know, when the patient is unstable and just presenting to the ICU, you may want to hold off long acting agents. Uh, the situation in a few hours could be completely different. You want things that are easily turned on, easily turned off, easily titratable drugs. So nicardipine is a good choice. And, and actually the previous trial best two for their blood pressure management, they, they, they use nicardipine. Um, clavidipine is also a good calcium channel blocker that, that, that's used in this setting. And then labetalol, uh, a beta blocker, a mixed alpha beta blocker is also, is also fine in, in, in this context. Is there a role for actually raising blood pressure in some of these patients? It's an interesting question. You, you know, per the guidelines and from our clinical experience, there may be a, set of, a subset of patients where that's the appropriate thing to do. What kind of patients are we talking about here? So somebody with a fluctuating deficit, large uh, vessel occlusive disease with a large penumbra, and you know, you're seeing a variation, and we have patients sometimes that at 160, they look okay, at 137 systolics, they have worsening hemiparesis, worsening aphasia, and it may be a good reason to, to start them on pressors. Um, routinely, you do not want to use pressors in all stroke patients, but in a certain subset, again, large penumbra, large territory at risk, uh, fluctuating neurologic deficits, it may be appropriate to, to, to implement a trial of, of, of vasopressors. Um, generally speaking, after 24 hours, if you haven't seen um, a good response, you probably should stop the pressors. Um, so you really should see you, 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 you should see some meaningful clinic, clinical improvement as you're targeting higher BP goals. So TPA, we know TPA is associated. You know, occasionally we encounter clinically significant hemorrhagic transformation after TPA. And what do we consider clinically significant? Generally speaking, um, an NIH stroke scale increase of four or more points to us is clinically significant. That's a meaningful increase. Um, and you could see, you know, per the original literature, 0.6% in the placebo group, 6.4 in the TPA group. 
Not all of these 6.4 are, you know, catastrophic hemorrhages in that TPA group, but there's certainly uh, some percentage where it really is a, a big deal. It's very significant hemorrhagic conversion. And, and you could see the good outcome in the placebo group is 29% and 41% in the TPA group. And you really should try to distinguish what is clinically significant. Very often you can have, uh, you know, some, some component of hemorrhagic transformation, whether you get TPA, whether you just have a large infarct, whether you get a thrombectomy or reperfusion therapy, you want to tr try to sort of tease out, is this clinically significant or not? And, you know, just based on the qualitative data, an NIH stroke scale of four or more would probably point in the direction that it is a significant hemorrhagic conversion. So what do we do, right? This is the most feared complication of IV thrombolytic therapy. So this is straight from the stroke guidelines. Obviously, you're going to stop TPA uh, infusion if it, if it hasn't completed already, and TK, TNK is much quicker to administer. You want to get a stat set of labs, CBC, you want a PT, INR, fibrinogen level, you want to get a cross match in preparation for blood products. Um, you should get an emergent head CT to document evidence of hemorrhagic conversion. And really the mainstay treatment is cryoprecipitate. So if you give TPA and within the first, you know, these complications usually occur right on administration or maybe within the first six hours, really within the first 24 hours, if there, if there is clinically significant hemorrhagic transformation, you should consider giving these patients cryoprecipitate and you, you wanna replenish their fibrinogen levels and you really should be targeting at least above 150. Uh, to minimize any additional bleeding and to, and, and to prevent any, any further complications. For any really life, potentially life-threatening bleeding, you should consider antifibrinolytics, which is tranexamic acid and aminocarpoic acid. So if the bleeding is very severe, in addition to cryoprecipitate, you should consider one of these agents as well to, uh, to, to, to reverse some of the TPA effects. And you know, TPA has a, has a relatively short half-life as well. We'll talk a bit about that. So some of the medical issues, antiplatelets. So patients who have received TPA or TNK generally do not get any additional blood thinners for at least 24 hours. You wanna ensure clinical stability. You wanna ensure radiographic stability. They often get a CAT scan at around the 24 hour mark. Um, and, and at that point, if, 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 you know, if they're deemed appropriate, you can resume antiplatelet, uh, you can start antiplatelet therapy, aspirin being the one that's studied the most in this setting and is the one that is really recommended. Um, so if patients don't receive an IV thrombolytic, uh, most of the patients that are coming to us in the ICU should be given an antiplatelet, should be given aspirin. How about statin what is the role of statin uh we're going to just travel back in time to 2006 new england journal of medicine this is the famous sparkle study so high dose atorvastatin and how do they define high dose 80 milligrams of atorvastatin after stroke or tia and what did they find so in patients with recent stroke or tia 80 milligrams of atorvastatin per day reduced the overall incidence of strokes and cardiovascular events. So, you know, really the standard of care at this institution, every single patient with an acute ischemic stroke receives high dose statin, which is Lipitor 80 milligrams, unless there are some contraindications. What would those be? Uh, transaminitis, liver dysfunction, history of having myopathy associated with statins, uh, you know, those patients, we probably wouldn't want to put them on a high dose statin immediately. Otherwise, your standard patient um, would, would, would start, you know, within the first 24 to 48 hours, high dose statin therapy. Interesting, just to take a look at this, they did notice a small increase in the incidence of hemorrhagic stroke associated with statins. So definitely the thromboembolic events decreased significantly, but there was a small increase in hemorrhagic strokes. Whether or not, you know, it was a true signal, it's still kind of controversial in, in, in the literature. There is some, there is some, there is a hypothesis that, you know, you need cholesterol as part of your cell membranes and it, they, they, they ensure stability and integrity of the cell membrane. So lowering your LDL too much 
theoretically may increase your intracerebral cerebral hemorrhage rate. Um, but again, this, this, is, this is still relatively controversial. It has been shown in some studies and, and maybe, maybe not kind of not seen in, in, in other studies. Hyperglycemia, you know, a lot of the patients with stroke, again, they have common risk factors, uh, uncontrolled high blood pressure, diabetes. What is the role of hyperglycemia in acute stroke? What do we know about high glucose in the ICU setting, especially in the neurologic population with acute infarcts? Uh, you know, the literature is, 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 is really conclusive. You have a worse functional outcome associated with higher glucose. And we're just talking about, you know, patients with diabetes here, um, not, not patients with, with normal glucose at baseline. Lower rates of recanalization. So even the thrombectomies are less successful if you have a high glucose rate. Expansion of the infarct, higher rates of hemorrhagic complications. This has been demonstrated in multiple trials. When you get TPA or reperfusion therapy, if your blood glucose is terribly uncontrolled, it, re it leads to higher hemorrhagic conversion rates and increased mortality, longer hospital stay, and, um, and, and a whole myriad of other things. So the question comes up, what should be the optimal blood glucose in these patients in the ICU? What is the range? This was published uh, in 2019, just a few years back. This is in JAMA. This is the SHINE trial. Intensive versus standard treatment of hyperglycemia. And specifically, these are patients with acute ischemic stroke. Um, and it was a multi-center trial of 1,100 patients with acute stroke. and the trial was aiming to see, is there any benefit in functional outcome at 90 days if you're very aggressive with your blood glucose management? So we know hyperglycemia is a bad thing. We know it leads to other, uh, other complications down the line. Is there a benefit to being very aggressive? And here, aggressive blood glucose management is defined as 80 to 130. And the answer is no. You know, 1,100 patients were randomized to aggressive glucose management versus the standard of care. At 90 days, absolutely no difference in their functional outcome. But what we did have is a lot more complications in the aggressive blood glucose lowering group. Um, you know, you had many, many patients that had hypoglycemic events. And what we don't want is an, an, an injured brain with an acute stroke and having periods of hypoglycemia, right? That really can increase your secondary brain injury. And we wanna avoid that. So there's not a whole lot of benefit for aggressive glucose control, but there are a lot of complications down the line. So, the, you know, the guidelines as of right now, we're, and these are, these are applicable to our stroke patients. These are also applicable to all of our ICU patients without stroke who have diabetes. 140 to 180, that's what we're aiming for, 140 to 180. That should be their blood glucose range. It really appears that that's the Goldilocks zone. Anything above that, you know, is, is uh, again, as I was saying before, is associated with other uh, bad parameters. Anything in, the, in this range is probably a good thing. And, you know, if you get a couple of numbers, 300 plus, start an insulin drip. It's completely appropriate to start an insulin drip, figuring out what their requirements are over 24 hours, and then transitioning more to sub-Q. Therapeutic temperature modulation. Any benefit? Well, what do we think about fever in ICU? What do we think about temperature? This, this is, uh, you know, the incidence of fevers and thermal dysregulation issues is very, very high. Up to 30% of patients with large strokes will experience this during their hospitalization. And what do we know about fever? Fever increases metabolic rate of the brain, increasing oxygen consumption, which we don't want in a, in a patient where it's a, the blood flow to the brain is compromised. It worsens demand perfusion relationship. You know, shivering is not a good thing for your ICPs. And really, I. The standard of care, you know, there are patients in the general ICU population where you can watch a fever and you shouldn't be too aggressive. If you have a patient in the MICU with sepsis and you have a fever of 102, you know, there's not really good literature that you should try to be aggressive in lowering them to normal thermia. In our stroke patients and in general with neurologic injury, you really want to be aggressive about fever management. And our goal in these patients is normal thermia, defined as 
37, 37, 3. Um, so it, a, a lot of our patients do have fever during their ICU course. Uh, you should start conserv conservatively with Tylenol. If that doesn't work, maybe a cooling blanket is needed. Um, and again, our goal with these patients is to avoid fever, to reduce fever, and, and the goal is normal temperature. Then the question comes, if we know fever is bad and treating fever is, you know, is, is something that we should do, is there any benefit to hypothermia? You know, just like when you sprain your ankle, you put some ice to reduce the swelling on it. Can the same process play out in the brain? If you have an acute injury, will cooling a patient help with their outcomes? Um, you know, because occasionally for refractory ICP crisis, we do cool patients. Um, and I want to just share this trial published in 2019, uh, JAMA Neurology, outcomes of hypothermia in addition to decompressive hemicraniectomy in malignant MCA strokes. And we'll discuss what that means, malignant. You know, generally it's 50% or more of the MCA territory. Some people go by two thirds. Generally more than half of your MCA territory is infarcted. That's considered malignant, which is very high risk for deterioration. So these patients got a hemicraniectomy. Half of their skull was removed by a surgeon to allow you know, space for the swelling brain to, uh, to, to, to not compress other important tissues and not to herniate. And in addition to that, they, they received hypothermia to see if that can alleviate some of the swelling and it can improve their outcomes and maybe even reduce their mortality. What did we get here? So 50 patients were randomized here with large strokes who received hemicraniectomy and 25 patients underwent uh, hypothermia, 25 patients just underwent uh, hemicraniectomy without hypothermia. In, so in patients with large MCA strokes, hypothermia, hypothermia did not improve mortality and functional outcome compared to standard of care and may cause serious harms in this specific setting. It's an interesting paper. What kind of harms are, are we talking about when you're cooling patients? Again, we talked about fever control. You really should be aggressive with fever, but the goal is normal temperature. Should you be lowering their temperature to hypothermia? And, you know, it was very clear they had to stop the trial early. When you're actively cooling somebody, you know, the days on the ventilator increased. The, the, the amount of days they required sedation increased significantly. Cardiovascular complications increased, arrhythmias. Um, so, and at the end of all that, they had exactly the same mortality and the same functional outcome, just with more complications. So, you know, these therapies are not benign, you know, to be on the ventilator, to require more sedatives during your hospitalization. Uh, so, at this point, Induced hypothermia is not recommended outside of clinical trials. So just to recap, we're aggressive about fever control in the ICU. You know, at this point, there's no role in hypothermia in cooling patients who present with acute ischemic strokes. And this is why you want to have randomized trials, because this trial was founded on a body of literature that shows that, uh, and, and it was more retrospective, that shows that Patients who received hypothermia did well, did better. And clearly, when you do a prospective randomized trial, it's, 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 it's better quality of evidence. So we saw no improvement in, in, in functional outcome, no improvement in mortality, more complications with hypothermia. Malignant strokes. So again, what do we mean by malignant? Um, malignant, usually the literature definition is half of the MCA territory or more. You know, this image that I, I'm showing you here is actually the entire hemisphere, right? You have the ACA that's infarcted, you have the PCA, and then the MCA as well. And, and, and this is what's called a hyperdense left MCA sign. This is actually a thrombus that you can see on a regular CAT scan because it's very calcified, the clot. So you see this um, hyperdense sign with, a, with an associated very large infarct. And the patient already had a history of a right-sided infarct that you can see here. And look at the amount of swelling, right? This is very, very catastrophic amount of swelling. And this is why anticipation of problems with these patients is very important. You can have a patient, again, with a right MCA stroke. They're awake. They're speaking to you because their left hemisphere is intact. They're following commands. And then on day two, day three, 
um, you know, when this edema really revs up, uh, you have a really life-threatening amount of cerebral edema and, and possible herniation, which is the most feared complication. The mortality rate with malignant MCA strokes is up to 80%. So it's very, very significant, very significant. And edema often peaks at 48 to 72 hours. And again, I, I'm just going to emphasize this point. Anticipation of problems with these patients is super important. Whether it's whether you're dealing with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhages and you're, you're you know you have them on vasospasm watch, which is a delayed complication, day five to nine, or you have a large stroke and you're anticipating cerebral edema, at 48 to 72 hours, that's when the the, the edema peaks, typically speaking. Um, so you really want to observe them and monitor them very, very closely for this, for the peak edema that they have. And you want to make sure that patients get safe through their peak edema and that most of the swelling is already behind them before you start to kind of relax your therapies. And it is cytotoxic edema, a little bit above physiology. So there's no blood going to the brain. There's no oxygen, no ATP can be formed. And without the sodium potassium ATPase pump, you have intracellular accumulation of sodium ballooning of cells, and then they, they swell up and they rupture. And this is, this is what cytotoxic edema looks like. Um, and because of this intracellular accumulation, it's a different pathology than, let's say, swelling in the brain from a brain tumor. So steroids are not effective in this setting. It's just a different, different kind of a physiology. We don't use steroids here. They're, 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 they don't work in this kind of a, for, for this specific um, uh, pathology. So how do we manage uh, edema? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll touch a little bit about, so the umbrella, you know, the, the, the umbrella is really hyperosmolar therapy. Two therapies fall under the umbrella of hyperosmolar therapy, mannitol and hypertonic saline. The easy dose to remember for mannitol is one gram per kilogram. And mannitol is an osmotic diuretic. So mannitol draws in fluid from other tissues into the intravascular space, and then it makes you pee it out. So you have to be careful about developing hypovolemia if you're given a lot of mannitol because they will diurese and you don't want to cause hypovolemia in acute stroke. Hypertonic saline is also osmotic therapy. So it draws in fluids from other tissues and it, taints, it tends to keep it in the intravascular space. Um, and, you know, the, the, the reason I'm making that distinct, distinction is sometimes you may want to, you know, we often prefer hypertonic saline, all else being equal, but there are situations where mannitol may be preferred. If you have CHF, ejection fraction of 15%, do you really want to increase intravascular volume? Uh, if you have pleural effusions, right, a lot of fluid in the lungs, um, uh, hypertonic saline may worsen that. And mannitol, maybe you're looking for the diuretic effect. So it will help with the ICPs and it will help um, as far as um, the diuresis and general volume status. What kind of um, concentrations of, of, of hypertonic saline are available? Also, for, for the most part, now you can administer hypertonic saline through a peripheral line, but you really need to take a lot of precautions. It has to be a large bore IV. Uh, it has to be checked on frequently. Uh, for the most part, you want a midline or a central line to administer the hypertonic saline, which is our approach here. Uh, the common concentrations of hypertonic saline used throughout the country and in this hospital is 3% hypertonic saline and 23.4% known in, in neurocritical care as the bullet. It's literally 30 cc's of super concentrated salt solution uh, that you push very slowly over three to five minutes um, and the effect is fairly rapid, you know, within minutes, it starts to take effect. So again, 23.4%, 30 cc's, super concentrated, um, and, and, and that may be appropriate in, in, in a lot of the patients. And the question also comes up, what should our sodium goals be in these patients? What are we aiming for? What is, how do we monitor these patients? Generally speaking, if a patient presents with normal sodium at baseline, normal defined as 135 to 146, our goal would be 150 to 155. And a lot of the times, especially when, when you know, Medi MICU fellows rotate with us, they're always concerned about rapid increase of sodium. 
Are you going to cause osmotic demyelination syndrome? Are you going to cause CPM, right? Central pontine myelolysis. Are you going to cause that? And the answer is fortunately not. Uh, I mean, I give a lot of hypertonic saline for a living. I haven't caused the, uh, you know, CPM yet. Uh, and the, and the question is why, you know, MCUC is a different patient population. 98% of patients who develop uh, osmotic demyelination syndrome are, have a presenting sodium of less than 120. So 120 or less. So if you're coming through the door with a sodium of 119, you should really be careful about rapid sodium increase. Otherwise, if you're starting with a normal, say, uh, normal sodium level, if you're at 140, you can, you can go to 155 within 15 minutes and it's not gonna cause a problem. Okay, so I just wanna kind of put it out there. And there's a lot of literature that looked for this in the TBI setting, in the ICH setting, in the acute stroke setting, and this is a very rare condition. I mean, it's rare even in hyponatremic patients, but uh, it's just a different patient population. Uh, so again, if you have a sodium that's, if you're hyponatremic, especially chronic hyponatremia, so a sodium of 120 or less, be very, very, very cautious about rapid ad administering hypertonic and, give, and, and rapidly r raising the level. Uh, anybody with a normal sodium, it should not be a problem. And you're actually looking for the, for the rapid osmotic effect. That's the whole point. You don't want to let the body adjust. You want to cause a rapid osmotic shift so that the tissues, so that the fluid uh, leaves the tissues and goes into the intravascular space, including from the brain. And, you know, the therapies, if you have an ICP monitor, which uh, some of our patients do, when you administer either mannitol or 23.4%, within minutes, you'll sometimes see a notable difference uh, uh, in their ICPs. Hemicraniectomy. So in what situations uh, would we consider removing half of the skull in very large, what we say, malignant MCA strokes? to compensate for all of the edema, right? Look at the same patient. On the arrival, starting to show signs of loss of gray-white differentiation and an acute infarct on the right hemisphere. Uh, again, you're seeing the right MCA, hyperdense MCA sign here. This is the thrombus that's actually uh, inside the middle cerebral artery. And now you're s developing severe hypodensity and, and, and swelling. And look at the, you know, if you look at the nice sulci and gyre before here, all of that is obliterated, it's gone. And this patient underwent a hemicraniectomy and look at the amount of brain tissue that actually is protruding outside of the skull defect. You know, had the bone been here, this patient would not have survived. So hemicraniectomy is an important part of, of, of comprehensive stroke care. A lot of patients may, may, may need to have uh, the, the procedure. So what data do we have? This is the famous, very, very famous um, pooled analysis, this was, you know, the trials were done in European countries. Um, you have Germany, you have France, and you have Netherlands. Uh, three, uh, three of those countries uh, almost simultaneously published papers regarding hemicraniectomy for a large ischemic strokes in the MCA territory. And, you know, all of the patients needed to have the procedure within the first 48 hours, and they were all 18 to 60 years old. So, and, and, and Lancet, you know, did a pooled analysis, uh, put all of these patients together and published a very nice paper that really determines a lot of what we do today. Does hemicraniectomy improve outcome after malignant stroke? So I'll show you the, the modified ranking scale, which is the, 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 the scale for disability in the next slide. Uh, hemicraniectomy resulted in 50% less mortality in these patients, okay? So 50% of them, 50% less patients died. And if you really look at the skewing, here we go, a significant improvement in their functional outcome. So this is six, this is death, right? So this is the conservative treatment without surgery, just getting the, the, the standard medical care. 71%, right? We're talking about close to 80% mortality. In this official clinical trial, 71% of patients died with, this, with such a large stroke. And again, to anticipate problems, they don't die on arrival. They die as, the, as, the, as, uh, as they develop peak edema and herniate, usually day two, day three, day four. And the patients who got surgery, you look at the mortality, 
compared to 71. And look at the, 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 the lower modified ranking uh, scores increased significantly. So a lot more patients that have underwent the procedure have a better functional outcome. Slight disability, minimal disability, moderate disability. So, you know, these are the patients that the trials looked at and really under the age of 60, you really need to have a good reason not to offer patients hemicraniectomy, depending on the situation, whether, you know, they could have been sick, there's other things at play, obviously, but under the age of 60, somebody with a large stroke, they should be considered, for, you know, for, for, for hemicraniectomy. What are some issues with, with hemicrania? So, yeah, justified in younger than 60. How about older than 60? It's, you know, we're drawing sort of an arbitrary line, right? 60 years old. So you don't want to be too dogmatic. You know, if you have a 63-year-old marathon runner who presents with a large stroke, possibly this may be a good candidate for hemicraniectomy. And I guess I, I didn't include it here, but a couple of lines. There is a trial published in New England Journal of Medicine Destiny 2, which looked specifically at the role of hemicraniectomy for a large ischemic strokes in patients over 60, specifically looking at the elderly population or advanced age. What did the trial find? Significant decrease in mortality. I mean, a lot, similar to what we're seeing here. So a lot less patients died, but you know, the functional status of the surviving patients was very, very poor. Most of these patients needed around the clock care, trached, pegged, bed bound, and just needing constant care, right, in the nursing home. So it really is an individual decision after, you know, as you, as, uh, uh, with a more advanced age population, you really have to take an individualized appro approach and see if you want to offer something like that to these patients. Um, because you can do a lot, you know, to make patients survive, but we also have to kind of prepare the family and figure out the patient's values. You know, would they want to survive in such a situation um, where they need constant around the clock care? Optimal timing is not known. So, you know, it's interesting. These patients in the, in, in the, in the, in the clinical trials, they went very early for a hemicraniectomy before, uh, before clinically significant swelling was even apparent. Do you really want to take all patients with large strokes and do a hemicraniectomy before they start swelling? That's a tough thing to do. Um, you, but you don't want to be late. You really want to do it before there's really irreversible injury. When you blew a pupil, when you're comatose, it, you're too late to do a hemicraniectomy. So finding the optimal time is a bit difficult. Uh, you really, really need to keep a close eye neurologically, maybe frequent imaging. Uh, and the moment you see, you know, space occupying lesions, edema, that may be the time to take the patients. Uh, but the exact timing is still debated, you know, it's, uh, when is the best time to, to, to take these patients to OR. And then finally, stroke laterality. Is it important? Uh, you know, we talk a lot about the dominant hemisphere. If somebody's right-handed and they have a left-sided stroke, um, what kind of functional outcome are they going to have? They won't be able to speak, presumably. They won't be able to meet, uh, to move their dominant right side. Uh, and, you know, I'll, myself and neurosurgery colleagues, we do look at that. But if you look at the literature, they didn't differentiate between right-sided strokes, left-sided strokes. All these patients were included. And we have seen ourselves, even with a dominant hemispheric stroke, patients can still do well, ultimately. Um, but you really, it does come up very often, you know, if you have a dominant hemisphere that's involved, how aggressive do you want to be in this situation, given inability to speak and again, move your dominant side. So there's still a lot of, you know, things that need to be, uh, you know, figured out here. So I'll leave you off with some summary principles, you know, appropriate treatment of acute stroke is, is essential. It does reduce mortality. It does reduce morbidity. Uh, that's why patients go to specialized facilities that are capable of taking care of such patients. Uh, prevention of secondary neurologic damage is really the key. It's very, very important. You know, again, all of the things that we discussed, fever management, um, complica bleeding complications, uh, hypoxia, hypercapnia, all of these issues, glucose control, all of these issues are very important in this patient population. Anticipation and management of cerebral edema. Right, part of what makes a good multidisciplinary approach is having a patient and you're anticipating 
this patient's at risk for getting worse, right? And, and you're prepared for it. You're not reactive. You, you, you have a plan. And when things come up, you know exactly what, what should be done in this situation, including myself, including neurosurgery, the stroke team. You know, we all talk about these patients and we're prepared uh, it, it, for, for any kind of, you know, clinical changes. Um, and finally, management of complex stroke. It really is a multidisciplinary approach. It's even my critical care patients. It's not just the critical care, right? It's good stroke care, it doesn't just start in the ED. It really starts maybe with EMS, right? As they notify us that these patients are en route, we get prepared for them, we're on the lookout for them, we're ready to receive them. So even EMS plays an important role. The emergency department plays a big role. Um, and obviously, even in the ICU, it's not a one-man show. There's a lot of uh, di different disciplines that are overseeing the care of these patients and making great contributions to their overall care. Thank you. Thank you. Great discussion, great talk. Thank you, Dr. Levin. Any questions for Dr. Levin? I will go for a second this time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And you, you mentioned about the 140 to 180 that the uh, the glucose level. That's the idea one, right? So that's the fasting or random any time. Any number. In any the, time. In a diabetic patient, yes. A, 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 at any point. So normally we have an insulin sliding scale and we monitor glucose every six hours. So Regardless of whether you're NPO, whether you're eating, if it's above 180, you have a sliding scale and you should, it should be covered. We're always looking for 140 to 180, whether you're eating or not. For the hemicranial uh, ectomy, and after that, uh, the patient will be the, uh, the bad bound or the, the wheelchair bound. So not necessarily, it's a good question. I think that that's part of the difficulty in figuring out whether you wanna offer somebody a hemicraniectomy. Um, you know, as you could see, you know, per, per, per the literature, there are patients that still have a very mild disability. They may need some assistance for activities of daily living, but they're still modified ranking one and two. Uh, I think a total of 15% of patients fall into that category there. Um, so not necessarily, you know, there are patients that do well, they may need help with their daily activities, um, but they, you, can you can still have very good outcomes. But again, as I was mentioning, in the group above 60, really very few patients there have good outcomes above the age of 60 after hemicraniectomy. Uh, most of them need around-the-clock care. So this is why it's an important, uh, you know, it's an important two-way discussion with the family, figuring out the values of the patient and, and their goals and, you know, what, what we, what's best for that patient. Anything else? Thanks. Uh, regarding uh, permissive hypertension, do you, per, you said 24 to 48 hours, which is your preference and how do you decide between the two times? Um, yeah, so basically, as I was saying, half of the beta blocker dose I resume right away and you, you're looking at the, at the clinical status. Does the patient have severe neurologic deficits still? Are they getting better? Are they stable? At least they shouldn't be getting worse. Maybe at day two, we're gonna start to reintroduce some of their home meds, which also don't kick in the moment you give them, right? The ACE inhibitors, the calcium channel blockers, amlodipine, you know, these things also take hours to, to kick in and we kind of, it's a stepwise approach. So at 24 to 48 hours, we start to reintroduce them and very often, you know, they still need very close monitoring before, you know, before their blood pressure is optimized. So it sounds like 24 is absolute, and then you play with the next day. That's fair enough, yeah. Related question, because I've encountered this on stroke call. Patient comes in, their blood pressure uh, happens to be like 180 over 90, and then uh, I'm being asked, should we raise it or not? The patient is not doing the, all that. Patient's doing reasonably well, all things considered. Do I keep them the way they are, or do I bring up the blood pressure? And we're assuming no thrombo, no TPA, no thrombectomy? Correct. You know, 180 is on the higher side. You need to have a good reason to start pressing patients, right? Because presses are also not benign. It's, you know, occasionally it's easier if the patient's auto-regulating and they're 190 themselves to let them be there, right? If the patient's just 190 without us doing anything, we can just watch them. To actually intervene and raise their blood pressure, you need to have a good reason to do that. 
because you know pressors are also not benign right you're actually causing the heart to work more um and really for you to use pressors you uh, some of the things i was mentioning neural uh, uh fluctuating neurologic exam where it's actually dependent on a certain number otherwise you know a, as a routine 180 you would just let them be the point of that is you know not to uh, to, to, even if they're 192 or five, to sort of let them hang out there the first day or two, not to artificially bring them there yourself. I totally agree. Actually, a second, you know, Ilya's point. You should look at the patient, right? The patient is doing well. Their brain is auto adjusting the pressure that required to perfuse the, the, the tissue. So you may not need to do anything, just monitor them, right, for the acutely. Um, if they, they have fluctuating symptoms or worsening symptoms, that means cerebral, you know, decrease hypoperfusion or there's hemorrhage, then you do accordingly to control the professional accordingly. Yep. We have patients where it's very clear. They're 163 and they look fine. And then they're 137, 140, and clearly they're worse. Uh, those are the types of patients you really can try uh, vasopress vasopressors and, and, and monitor them clinically. Hi, uh, Maura Connolly from Stony Brook Hi. Hospital. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, would you say the difference in outcomes in a, the modified ranking, like from say a zero one to like up to a four or five, the major difference is time? And also if, if so, and what are you guys doing to reduce door to needle time, door to device? I just want to understand your question correctly. So modified ranking, uh, what the, the question is about the timing of, of this. So, um, in, in the difference in, in outcomes for patients. Yeah. So, um, is it about how much time the patient is stroking before you can intervene? Is that still the main, is that the I major? I guess the thing is, you know, still time is brain, right? Earlier is always better, whether it's, uh, reperfusion therapy, ID thrombolytics, uh, thrombectomies, we look at our metrics very carefully. So all of the things that you just mentioned, you know, the uh, door to needle time or the first pass for a thrombectomy, right? We look at all these metrics and we always want to shorten that period from the time the patient arrived to us to the time we establish reperfusion. Every minute counts an acute stroke. Uh, so it's very important. Having said that, the modified ranking that, that I'm showing here, most of the literature uses that, that metric as a functional outcome after stroke, and usually it's measured at 90 days. So all, most of the recovery you make after stroke is within that first 90 day period. So all of these stroke tr trials look at the 90 day modified ranking scale, score. Um, but you know, the things that you do on day one, day two, they make a difference, obviously, uh, down the line on day 90. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. No, I can hear you, but maybe okay. some other. Um, when you're there's been a lot of concern always about high blood pressure and how and high and getting it down in pressors. Unfortunately, many have seen the going low, and low isn't necessarily always better because it's the point of no return. So I just wondered if you could enlighten us on how low the risk is before if you go, you it's like you can't stop it. You cannot recover it. So can you shed some light on that, please? So I don't know if I have a, a, a very precise answer, but I'll just use the data for end organ perfusion, right? So sometimes you have otherwise healthier patients who are probably normotensive for, for whatever reason they have an ischemic stroke and they are, appear to us as hypotensive. And should we just watch them? Should we actually press them? It's a, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, normally, I get concerned if their maps are below 65. So 65 is accepted in medical literature as the acceptable blood pressure for end organ perfusion. And if you have a stroke, I get a little nervous on arrival if your maps are below 65. Uh, occasionally, we can go by systolics. If your systolics are less than 120 in that hyperacute period, I may get concerned. The question is, what do you do about it, right? So we always start with fluids if you want to, if, if needed. Um, you know, whether or not to press them, it's, it, it, there's not one right answer here. Uh, if their maps are really below 65 in the acute setting, I, I, I may decide to use vasopressors in that period until you get a better grasp of what's going on with the patient. 
Um, so either going by systolics above 120 or looking at maps above 65, whichever one's easier, because sometimes there's a white pulse pressure variation. Okay, you mentioned systolic. How about a little bit of information on the diastolic? You know, I Thank normally you. in the neural world, there's not a lot of literature on the diastolic pressure. We go either by systolics or maps. And all of the trials that look at blood pressure managing management, they really look at either your map or your systolics. Um, and and really, if your diastolic is low, it should reflect in your in your map, right? That's still a calculation of that. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hello. Hi, Dave Ledoux. Um, yeah, I second your vote on that. We don't use diastolic pressure in, you know, in ICU. Um, it will clearly affect, affect your map, but I think that's a tough question. What is the best blood pressure? We're still struggling with that. With ICH, um, even though based upon the two trials but um, that have been out. Uh, but as far as with stroke, how, how we tend to approach it is if it's the non-thrombectomy patient without having any invasive monitoring, no Lycox, no rheumatic, no microdialysis, you really have to go by your clinical exam. What we tend to do is if, if it's somebody that has a non-thrombosis, didn't intervene with TPA because we know what blood pressure we need to follow if they do, or a thrombectomy, which I'll get to in a second. Um, those are patients that I tend to see if there's no clinical improvement, no clinic. I try to augment their pressure to 20 millimeters of mercury systolic to see if there is any type of improvement. If I see some, I'll go to another increment of 20. If I don't see any improvement, um, that's my threshold, and that's when I stop. If it's a thrombectomy patient, there's what they, I'm sure you're familiar with the Enchanted um, MT trial that came out that looked at 120, 140, and 180. And they found that patients who had atherosclerosis, uh, they tended to keep them a little higher. You know, normally we'll get orders, you know, keep the pressure less than 140 after thrombectomy. But in those particular patients that had atherosclerosis, that you did treat, um, they did also look at what they call, and you should keep into consideration, your TAG score, which is the hemorrhagic conversion score after a stroke. What your pre-thrombectomy blood pressure is, your post-thrombectomy imaging. So there really is no clear-cut formula on what to keep the blood pressure. The idea is when a patient comes out, you know, and I say this for the audience, I mean, not for, but examine your patient. I mean, if you don't have any invasive monitoring, it's your exam that you really need to follow. And again, this is not patients who have received thrombolytics, um, you know, because we know what the numbers are for that. But it's really, what is your threshold based upon your exam? If you see no improvement, that's your threshold. But clearly, like you said, the lowest threshold is keeping them in a map of 65. This is where there's room for good clinical judgment, right? Uh, That's right. Not all That's the right. questions have specific evidence-based answers. And, you know, this is where it, it's it's good to, to, to know these patients and kind of use your clinical judgment in that specific context. I totally agree. Right. Um, okay. Going to mechanical thrombectomy and blood pressure control. I know definite ambiguity, but in your practice, what do you prefer to do? And what are the blood pressure parameters that you've become accustomed to? It's a good question. So we always, we have different neurointerventionalists, obviously Dr. Wang being one of them. So you always wanna figure out the preference of the neurointerventionalist that you're working with, obviously. Generally speaking, we still aim for successful thrombectomies less than 140. Um, you know, whether it's a partial thrombectomy, not super successful, you, I'm really cautious about aggressively lowering BP in those situations. Less than 160 is usually acceptable. But, you know, as a routine practice here, for a completely TK3, uh, complete reperfusion, we aim for less than 140. Whether or not it's the best number, I think that the, the literature still should give us more, more definitive answers. Thank you very much. I enjoyed your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I want to just uh, tag on that. I totally agree with Dr. Levin. I think it depends on the degree of reperfusion. Uh, we have this TK 2 b which is 50% recanalization, as opposed to TK 3 100%. So for those 100% recanalization, you want to avoid reperfusion injury to the best you could. So that's why we tend to 
lower to below 140 normal tensors. And for somewhere in between 75 or just one tiny branch occlusion distally, to make you know, somewhere in between 120 to 160 as opposed to 140 to 180, if it's taken to be, there's still a sizable territory that needs reperfusion. So that's in the general my rules of, but if you ask a different intervention, that may be different. Um, ladies first, ladies first. Hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm also from uh, Stony Brook Hospital. I just had a uh, general device question for you. Um, what are your thoughts on the IROFLOW system? So the irrigating EVDs, uh, we've been utilizing them a lot in our ICU. So just want your general thoughts on, are, are we gonna see them a lot in the future? Are you gonna utilize them? Do you utilize them? Uh, no, so the answer is I'm not sure about the system that you're using. I don't know if, if, you, if you're aware, Dr. Wang, I'm, I'm, I'm not, Our EVD is always open. We don't, we don't, just kidding. <laughs> no, we don't actually, we don't use that, the system over there. In, intrathecal antibiotics, is that what you said? I see. Do you ever give TPA in, for these patients? Sorry, and it's a continuous dose. We have it at a set rate. Um, we typically make them like RN one to one patients, so it's like one RN to one patient, and it's an irrigating EVD that continuously irrigates either saline, um, TPA, or an antibiotic for abscess patients. We've been seeing, so that's the system. So, what's the indication for doing doing the continuous irrigation? I'm not sure. I understand the uh, the rationale. Um, well, our attendings specifically use it. We, like I said, abscess patients um, for continuous. Um, irrigation with antibiotics. So we, we, that's what we were kind of using that for. And then um, IVH and just, yeah, those as, kinds of as things. As far as I know, you know, we do administer intrathecal antibiotics, but just not, it's not a continuous irrigation. This is a digital system and it gives you the continuous ICP. So we can always see the ICP at all times, just not MRI compatible or anything like that. But um, What's the name again, just so we know. IraFlow and Rutgers was IraFlow? Ira, I R R A, yeah. IraFlow. Hmm. Interesting. Thanks. Uh, when is a uh, uh, high myocardiectomy required? Can we just uh, use more magneto instead? Oh, that's a really good question. The answer is no. Um, if generally speaking, and I deal with these patients routinely, neurosurgeons do as well. Mannitol, hyperosmolar therapy, they may let you skirt by a bit. They may buy you a little bit of time. But if you have severe cerebral edema, such as the images that I've shown you here, you really need to decompress the brain. Uh, mannitol alone, high, the best medical therapy alone will not be as effective as just taking the bone off. Because uh, you normally see on the follow-up scans, there's a lot of actually brain matter that's protruding out that you just can't get the same efficacy with mannitol, hypertonic, head of bed, hyperventilation, sedation, all of the best medical management is still not as good as actually taking the skull off. So you may buy time, but it's not sufficient. Agree, totally agree. That's for the temperate measure until you get all set up. So before the patient herniate and dies in front of you, that's the time you give hypertonic, especially the, uh, the, uh, the bullet. You push yes. 23 you know, hypertonic saline then to lower the, the, their uh, edema, you know, to buy time to, for the definitive treatment for uh, having cranium. I, if you don't have a question, I do have a question for you, for Dr. Levin. <laughs> Just to make, to make sure we have the, the money paid worth. <laughs> so, um, many of these patients actually may be semi-comatous or not responsive. And, you know, in the SEO setting, there's up to 30% of patients may be having non convulsive status. What is your threshold or clinical judgment indicators for doing an EEG or start uh, anti-epileptics? So fortunately, I can answer that. I deal with this, you know, fairly routinely. When do you need continuous EEG monitoring or in general uh, EEG monitoring, right? The simple answer is when your exam is out of proportion to the injury that you have. That's kind of a simple summary. You have a bleed. The patient looks a lot worse than you would anticipate based on their neurologic injury. What is causing this, uh, you know, exam to be so much out of proportion to what you're seeing on the imaging. So you really should try to look for alternative causes and maybe get a continuous EEG because sometimes a, a routine half an hour spot EEG doesn't really capture 
you know, everything that's going on, you know, day and night. So 24 hours may be reasonable. And just to bring it back to, to our discussion here, you know, ischemic strokes surprisingly have very little seizures associated with them because that brain is infarcted. Uh, the, the blood is very irritating to the brain. So any kind of hemorrhages typically irritate the brain tissue and, you, and, 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 and is well known to cause seizures. Ischemic strokes, that tissue is, is infarcted, it's dead. So it's unlikely that it's going to start seizing uh, if, if there's really an ischemia in that part of the brain. That's why in general, for ischemic strokes, we don't use seizure prophylaxis. Uh, and we see a lot less of uh, seizures associated in the acute setting. Obviously, down the line, there's encephalomalacia, there's scarring in the brain. You can develop seizures as a consequence of your stroke. Acutely, as you're presenting, you're way more likely to have seizures if you have an intracerebral hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, compared to an ischemic stroke. Uh, and that's why the guidelines don't even recommend seizure prophylaxis as compared to traumatic brain injury and, 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 and subarachs and ICHs where there's a little bit more room to do that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Elia.